happen to you this morning, Dr. Francis Brown. Amen. All of God's people said amen. amen. All of the Lord's people said amen again. Amen. Again, it is a wonderful uh, privilege to, to be here. Greater Friendship family uh, once again. Uh, we thank the Lord for uh, the invitation for Pastor Golf. I um, um, had to grovel a little bit this last time that he texted because the text before then, I forgot to get back in touch with him. And, and that's important to me because I ain't, I ain't, ain't too many people out there that like me. So I need to hold on to all the friends I can. <laughs> so I, I apologize and pleaded and said, I uh, asked him to forgive me and, and thank the Lord that he did. Because I, like I said, I ain't got too many friends. I got about nine of them out there. And um, some of them are slipping too, so amen. <laughs> so I want to hold on to anybody that call themselves liking me. Um, and thank the Lord uh, for him and for being here with you once again. Good to see my, my, my some church family members, my brother in the ministry and my sister there, uh, Brother Kelvin Washington and his wife, Cassandra. Good to see y'all. Y'all going to take me out to eat after service? Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Shalapaha. The Lord is good. <laughs> Thank the Lord for them. They've been so good. And good to see my friend, Johnny Golf Jr. I told him I thought I had his number in my phone. So I'm, I'm clearing up a lot of stuff uh, on this Sunday. So we, we, we are okay now. And it is also good to see uh, all of you again. Um, and we are praising God uh, for your anniversary, how he has blessed you to, to have another year's anniversary and for the revival coming up. I'm a little jealous because I know some of them preachers on the schedule for the revival. And, um, you know, I ain't never preached no revival here. <laughs> Damon coming and preaching and, and Jason coming and, 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 and preaching. I'm going to have to hear about that, you know. <laughs> And uh, see, Damon had already told me about it. Reverend, I got, I got, I got Brother Golf on my schedule. <laughs> and I said, you text him right after he texts you. Yes, I did. I said, okay, that's what happened there. But uh, we're praying for your revival. The Lord has blessed you with some good preachers, uh, many of whom I know, and thankful to him for that. Let's go to the Lord. God, how we thank you so much for your goodness and grace. We bless your holy and righteous name. Father, we thank you for this season of worship and celebration. Thank you for how faithful you have been to this church and to this pastor. And God, we thank you for his faithfulness to you through the ups and downs of ministry and, and trends and, and things that uh, happen in and out of the ministry. God, he has been yet faithful to you. And for that, we say thank you. We ask your blessings upon these, your people, on this day. Now, Lord, help us to proclaim your word. <clears throat> In the perfect name of Jesus, God, we ask that you would help us to empower your people. Help us, God, to minister to them, Lord. Ask that you would cut where you need to cut, challenge where you need to challenge, and soothe where you need to soothe. Lift these words from the regular, the mundane, and the natural, and make them supernatural in these the lives of your people. And God will be also careful as to give you all praise and glory. In the presence of Jesus, we ask, amen. Amen. I think it was about, you know, we're right around about the two-year anniversary of uh, Hurricane Harvey. Yes, and I was watching and reading some of the, the clippings and things that were on the internet, and I was surprised to discover that Hurricane Harvey ties with Hurricane Katrina as the worst and costliest natural disaster in U.S. history. Uh, but I noticed that I called a friend of mine who I went to seminary with, and we had a bit of a, a chuckle. Uh, he was living in New Orleans uh, and had to leave because, evacuate because of Katrina. And when they decided to go back about three, four years later, they said, well, we're going to go back to New Orleans, but we're going to take this cruise. And I remember getting this text from him, and the text said, stuck in the Gulf with a smiley face on it. And the smiley face was there because they were stuck in the Gulf because of a hurricane that was brewing in the Gulf. And in his mind, here I am trying to get back to New Orleans, 
and I'm still kept away from the city, or at the very least run out of the city, because of a hurricane. If you remember Hurricane Katrina, or even remember Hurricane Harvey for that matter, and they were both tied for the, 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 the worst disasters in U.S. history, there were over $115 billion worth of damage. Over 2,100 people in Katrina lost their lives. And hundreds of thousands of homes were destroyed between Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia. Incredible devastation and destruction. On, on the surface of the water, and, and in, on the surface of the land, we've got destruction and death and devastation. But if you were out in the Gulf and just 25 feet beneath the surface of the water, all was cool, calm, and collected. I said on the surface of the water and on the surface of land, we've got destruction, $115 billion in destruction, 2,100 people lost their lives, hundreds of thousands of homes destroyed between Louisiana, Mississippi, Georgia, and Alabama, but just 25 foot feet beneath the surface of the water. All was cool, calm, and collected. The fish were not bothered. Uh, they, 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 they went to fish school as normal. They hung out at the fish Walmart like normal. They ate at the fish Papados like normal. Everything was normal, cool, calm, and collected. And, and it made me think along these lines. Wouldn't it be nice if when you and I endure our storms, uh, we could be like those fish? <laughs> I mean, wouldn't it be nice, wouldn't it be just awesome, just wonderful, if when you, you, you and I endure our difficulties, endure our storms, that we could be just as unagitated as the fish, <laughs> uh, just as unaltered as the fish, just as undisturbed as those fish. Y'all looking at me like I don't know what I'm talking about, or unless you don't know anything about storms. I've got this for you. There are really only three kinds of people in this world. There are those who are in a storm, and those who are leaving a storm, some of y'all are in a storm right now. You might not even know, but you are in a storm right now where your life is being turned upside down and inside out by circumstances that you cannot control. <laughs> there are those who are in a storm. There are those who are leaving the storm. And if you're not in a storm and you're not blessed enough to be leaving the storm, hold on. Because you're the one that's headed for a storm. <laughs> But wouldn't it be nice that if when you and I go through our storms, we could have the same kind of peace that those fish had? I've got news for you. That kind of peace to you and I is available. Uh, to find out where, I want to draw your attention to Philippians chapter 4. The epistle of Philippians chapter chapter 4 Philippians chapter 4 Philippians chapter 4 Philippians chapter 4 if you're there say amen, amen. if you're not say wait up Philippians chapter, chapter 4. And we're going to begin our reading at verse number 7. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 7. Are you there? Yes. And the word of God reads, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Thank you. For a little while, I want to say a word about the promise of peace. The promise of peace. The words read in your hearing is an exhortation written by the Apostle Paul to a fine little church called Philippians Baptist Church. 
Um, this is one of the few churches in the New Testament uh, that wasn't just doing the fool. Uh, many of Paul's letters to churches, he was having to bring some correction uh, to some raggedy situations. Uh, um, the Corinthian church, which is the most talented church we see in, in the New Testament, had a lot of problems. They not only were suing each other, they had all, oh, I got these babies here, so I can't say it the way I want to say it, but they had some raggedy living throughout and through and through. Uh, uh, um, the Galatian church forgot uh, what their salvation was based on. Uh, the Thessalonian church was confused about the coming of Jesus, when it would happen, and its significance. Uh, the Ephesians church was dealing with, in terms of uh, Timothy dealing with them, they were dealing with false teachers. And, 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 and throughout all of these churches that Paul was writing to, he was always having to bring some correction, and he wasn't doing it nicely. <laughs> some of them he called bewitched, and other ones he just called flatfoot foolish and raggedy. But here with these, these tender believers here in Philippians, they, 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 they weren't immune to some difficult problems because they had some sisters fighting over choir robes in chapter 4, verses uh, 2 and 3. Uh, verses two and, three. and here they are, and Paul is saying, I want to let y'all know what's going on with me because he is in jail. He is not, well, begging, he's under house arrest. He is not writing from sabbatical. He is not writing from his summer home. He is not writing from his winter to vacation, he is writing as one who has endured and is enduring storms. Uh, he's been run out of town in Lystra and Derby. He's been beaten in the temple. He's been beaten in Iconium. He's been shipwrecked and now he's under house arrest in Rome and he is awaiting trial and if he is found guilty, he will surely be executed. So while he's there under house arrest, the Philippians decide we need to do something nice for Paul. We need to do something good for Paul. Paul has been good to us, so we need to be good to him. So they send him a financial gift. Ain't nothing wrong with giving a man of God a financial gift. He, they send him a financial gift and the encouragement of a man by the name of Epaphroditus. And when Epaphroditus gets there, or before he gets there, he almost dies of sickness. He gets there and tells Paul all that is happening in Philippi. And Paul says, listen, I need you to go back with them because they're having a difficult time because they're worried about you and they're worried about me. And I want them to be comfortable. I want their spirit to be at ease. But before you go, take this letter with you because I want them to understand how they ought to be acting while I am away and until you get back. When he gets back, Paul tells him, listen, I want you to understand something. My, my, so don't feel sorry for me because my circumstances have fallen out for the fervence of the gospel, he says in chapter 1. Don't be scared of what's happening to me because of what has happened to me. The word of God has gone forth. And you know what I want you to do? I want you to continue to proclaim the word of God. Then he says, now, I'm sending this. Thank you for your letter. But Epaphroditus has some instructions for you and something else. I don't want you all to forget. Do not put confidence in the flesh. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the false circumcision. Beware of the evil workers. Why? Because the only thing that will get you through is your solid relationship in Jesus. Now, let me tell you what I want you to do. Mr. Your Storms, here's something I want you to understand about this thing called peace. Peace is an incredible force. Peace is an incredible thing. First of all, I want you to understand this about peace. Peace is peculiar. <laughs> peace is a peculiar thing. It is peculiar in its nature and in its source. First, he says, and the peace of God. Peace is peculiar because of its source. <laughs> it is sourced in God. Boy, y'all looking at me like I don't know what I'm talking about. Let's look, when tra we trace this word peace through history, we find out that peace has several nuances. Peace comes from the Greek term eirene. And in classical Greek, peace simply meant freedom from inconvenience. Freedom from disturbance. Freedom from folk bothering you. 
Freedom from folk knocking on your door and you don't want them there. Freedom from folk instant messaging you. Freedom, you know, you know, folk that you block on your phone and don't look at me like you don't block folk. You block them because you don't want them destroying your peace. <laughs> That's right. Yes, you do. You, you put do not disturb on your phone and do not disturb on your office. Why? Because you do not want them destroying your peace. You send people to your voicemail instantaneously. Why? Because you don't want them destroying your convenience. You don't want your convenience. Y'all looking at me like you don't do that. You don't want for disturbing your convenience. You want some peace. As we get to the Old Testament, we see peace is represented by the Hebrew term shalom. And it means freedom from war. Yeah. Freedom from fighting factions, freedom from people uh, engaging in deadly behavior and deadly activity. For over 10 years, maybe more like 15, 16 years, this country here in the last uh, uh, millennium has dealt with war, the war in Iraq and the war in Afghanistan. And, 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 and what our folk have said, we were weary of war, no more war. Between these two wars, we had 58,000 casualties. That means people who have died or in some way been harmed by the ravages of war. Shalom means freedom from war. Some of the folk that voted the way they voted, they voted because they ain't want no more war. <laughs> we don't want nobody, we don't want no more military acts, no more military acts, no more military behavior. We want freedom from war. Yeah. Uh, but Paul does something different here with this word peace. In, 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 in Philippians. He, he takes the nuances of, of classical Greek and the nuances of the Old Testament and, and he uses it to his own advantages and he infuses a super dope of theology with it. And he says, I, 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 the peace of God, which means peace is unique because of its source. And here Paul says, peace means not freedom from inconvenience because if you're a believer, you're going to be inconvenienced. Folk going to bother you. Folk going to call you when you don't want to be called. Uh, just 25 years ago, I mean, when I started out in ministry, my mother had a problem for me every time I came home from work. Folk lined up in the driveway for me to pray for them. They wasn't praying. They didn't need me to pray for them. Last year, I used to have to hide my car and jump the fence and come home through the back way so I didn't have to put up with somebody. But that's not what we have here. This freedom is to be for freedom from God's wrath. <laughs> Says the peace of God. It is this peace is freedom from God's wrath. Y'all looking at me like I don't know what I'm talking about. And this freedom comes in Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 3 says the Ephesians were by nature children of wrath. Meaning because they were non-believers, they were not friends of God. God was not their friend. They were the objects of God's wrath. Yeah. Let me put a pin right there and just metal just a little bit. Please don't take what the world says about who God is and who people are. Years ago, uh, what's that? What was the song that all, all, uh, 1984, all the stars got together and seen Michael Jackson put them all together. And, and yeah, we are the world. And Willie Nelson has a line in that song, and he says, We're all a part of God's great big family. No, we ain't. <laughs> No, we ain't. You may be a creation of God, but until you name Jesus as your Savior, you are not a child of God. Until you have professed belief in Jesus for your eternal destiny, you are not a child of God. As a matter of fact, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 3, you are a child of wrath and thus a child of uh, a child of disobedience, thus a child of God's wrath. But Paul also says you ain't got to stay a child of God. God's wrath. The only way you can avoid God's wrath is to take part in God's peace. And he says in verses 13 and 14, Christ is our peace. In other words, in order to be right with God, you got to go through Jesus. Mm, ain't that something? In order to have a good relationship with God, you're going to have to come and trust, trust Jesus for your salvation. And so he says, and the peace of God, which is your salvation because you named Jesus, is great towards us. Yes. 
peace, peace, peace. The peace of God. Peace is unique. Peace is peculiar because of its source. It is sourced in God. It is the peace of God. Your salvation is comes from God and thus peace is unique because of its source. Now watch this. Peace is also unique because of its object. Everybody can have peace. Everybody can have peace. Only those who have named the name of Jesus can have peace. There's no reason to expect peace outside of Christ. Oh, so many of us have already discovered our jobs don't, don't help us with peace. Why? Because they're going to give you a pink slip. <laughs> Your money ain't going to help you with peace. Why? One bad reception is recession is all over. <laughs> Your car can't help you with peace because it depreciates as soon as you drive it off the lot. <laughs> Your house can't help you with peace because it only takes one little hurricane <laughs> to come through and wipe it off and the insurance don't even pay you for it. So there must be some... Uh, a solid structure, some solid force of peace. And the Bible says that is the peace of God, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Several years ago, back in the uh, early 90s, actually the late 80s, I worked in Congress. I worked in the United States Congress. And the building I worked in was this building called the Long Worth House Office Building. And, and in this building were only three floors. And, and I was lazy and I didn't want to walk those three floors. And, and so like everybody else, I was going to ride the elevator. Yeah. Now they only had two elevators. And, and so you go around the corner and you get, you get ready to get on this elevator. And there is an elevator where everybody has to stand and wait in line, Pastor. It's just gobs and gobs of people, 25, 30 people waiting to get on the elevator. But there is an elevator over to the left. Yeah, we got no line over there. Right. And, and, and when, you, when then the door opens, there is somebody in the elevator sitting on a stool, and they get paid what we call a salary to hit the number two or three to get you to the floor you want to get on. Well, you know me. I'm from Third Ward. I ain't got no sense. I like that elevator. <laughs> So one day I decide I'm going to walk from the back of the line and I'm going to go over here to this elevator, this special elevator they have. And I get on the elevator and, and, and I look at the guy and I tell him, three, please. And he looks at me and he shakes his head. I said, three, please. And he looks at me and he shakes his head. Well, maybe he don't want to work with me. Maybe he don't break 15 minute breaks or something like that. So I decide I'm going to go ahead and push number three. And as I go to push number three, he grabs my hand and then he points up to a sign. And there's a sign at the top of this elevator that simply says, member only. So everybody can't ride that elevator. That elevator is special for dignitaries. Only members of Congress can ride that elevator. Only uh, 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 officials that have been elected to office can ride that elevator. That ain't just for regular old Negroes. That's a special elevator. That's why I have to get off of that elevator. Let me see if I can help you and bless you right about now. The peace of God ain't for everybody. It is for members only. Only those who have named the name of Jesus can enjoy God's peace. The peace of God is peculiar. But watch this. The peace also, the peace of God is protective. He says, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. This word guard means to, uh, uh, to protect. It, it means to keep external intruders out. And, and, and it means to to, to, to to, to eject or to eradicate anything on the inside that should not be there. All right. All right. All right. All right. The picture of the word is this. Uh, Philippi is a colony of Rome. Right. It means it's, a, it's a, a full standing nation on its own, but it is controlled by another nation. Yeah. And what Rome has decided to do, we don't want anything non-Roman in Philippi. Uh -huh. 
if, if you're going to be a colony of Rome, you're going to have to think what Roman thoughts, feel what Roman, with the Roman heart, act according to the Roman will for the sake of the Roman government. Yes. And so what, what, the, what the Roman emperor has decided to do, he's going to, he puts uh, uh, military guards on the outside of the city and military guards on the inside of the city. Yeah. The military guards on the outside of the city are designed to keep anything non-Roman out. <laughs> if it ain't wrong, we don't want to put up with it here in Philippi. So it's designed to keep all non-Roman stuff out. Now the military personnel on the inside of the city is designed to, to put out any or to dispel any non-Roman influence that is within the city. Somebody show up and they don't want a Roman influence, they want a Greek influence, the military personnel is going to do what is necessary to get them out or to kill them while they're on the inside so nobody else wants to try it. So this idea of protection means you keep stuff out that shouldn't be on the inside and you put stuff out that you don't want on the inside. And so here when Paul says, and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart. In other words, Paul is saying this, whatever is on the outside that should not be in, your salvation will keep on the outside and whatever is on the inside, your salvation will put it out. Why? Because the last thing that God needs is for you to get depressed. The last thing that God God needs is for you to have a weak heart and a weak mind by him when it comes to stones. Why? Don't you clap right now because I'm going to make you mad. Because he know given one opportunity, you're going to act a fool and turn your back on yeah, okay, yeah, I can't get no way man said. All right, all right, all right. Yeah, so, so you said, no, no, I, would, I wouldn't dare do that to God. I wouldn't dare turn my back on the Lord. I wouldn't dare uh, turn my back on God. I wouldn't dare dis disobey God in the time of the storm. You know, there's a dude named Peter that said that. <laughs> he said, God, I got you. Jesus, I got your back. I don't care what these other yah-yahs do, but I will never turn my back on you. You know what, Jesus, all these other hard heads going to turn their back on you? I would never do do that and Jesus said, come on, Peter, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Before the cock crows three times, you are going to deny me. Before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times, Peter. And just a chapter and a half later, Peter said, I don't know that man. I said, I don't know that man. Blah, 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 blah. I don't know that man. <laughs> Looking at me like I don't know what I'm talking about. God told Israel, you know what, Israel? I'm going to move you around nations as I lead you through the wilderness. Because if you see how mighty these nations are, you're going to fake the funk and get scared and turn your back on me. And they said, we wouldn't dare do that, God. Soon as they got into Canaan, they start adopting foreign gods, marrying foreign women, doing foreign things, doing raggedy stuff. So much so that God said, you know, I'm about to put y'all aside because I knew you you couldn't handle being around for without acting the fool. So be careful when you profess, I will not turn my back on God. Let God keep stuff out. Say, so, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your mind. Now when he says he will guard your heart and your mind, he ain't saying bad stuff won't happen. What he is saying, I will protect your heart and your mind while you're going through the bad stuff so that you don't lose faith. So that you don't crack up. So that you don't lose your mind. You don't have to lose your mind from going through a difficult situation. Why? Because you're a child of God. And God has said, if I can resurrect the dead Jesus, I can help you make it through cancer. If I can resurrect the dead Jesus, so what boo left you? He should have left you in the first place because he was keeping you from me. So what the job gave you a pink slip. Now you got more time to pray. Don't worry about the difficulties that's happening in your life. Why? Because he's saying the peace of God will keep you from cracking up. Protect your heart and your mind. My, 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 my first year of seminary, and the Lord knew he had to let this happen my first year. I, I'm working at what they call, used to call Eckerd Drug Store. It's, it's CVS now. And I was working at Eckerd Drug Store, and I was making some good money. And, and one day, my manager comes to me, and he says, Francis, I got some good news and some bad news. Now, now, now how many of you know, anytime somebody tell you they got good news and bad news, 
bad. It's all bad. It's all bad. They're just trying to minimize the effect. And, and, and he says, the good news is this. You still have a job. He said, but the bad news is I'm going to have to cut your salary. And, and I said, Randy, you need to understand something. Now, when I took this job, I told you what I need as a bare minimum. And I needed the bare minimum of $12 an hour. That, 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 that was just to get the ends to look at each other. Yeah, they, 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 weren't, they, weren't even, they weren't meeting. Nah, they, you know, just, just one end was recognizing the other end was an end. That looked like an end over there. That's, 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 that's what they were doing. And, and so, so I can't afford to take a pay cut. He says, well, I'm going to have to cut your salary from 12 to $8. And he says, or you're going to have to start working the normal hours that managers work. Now, managers work a, a, a normal hours, about 55 to 60 hours. And so as I'm sitting there, I'm saying, okay, let me think. I said, well, I can't take the pay cut, and I can't take the additional hours. He says, then what do you want me to do? I said, you got to decide what you're going to do. He said, well, man, I'm going to have to cut you and let you go. I said, hey, man, you do what you got to do. And so that was it. And, and later on, he pulled me aside. He says, friends, help me. I, 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 I said, my, my, you know, my thinking is kind of crazy. You need $12 an hour. Yes, I need $12 an hour. You need 30 hours a week. I need 30 hours a week. He says, but if I cut you to $8, you lose money. And you can't do that. No, I can't do that. But friends, if I, 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 if I cut you, period, if I let you go, you ain't got no money coming in. No, I ain't got no money coming in. He said, well, friends, I, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not a brain surgeon. I'm not a mathematician. I'm not a rocket scientist. No, son, 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 son of a rocket scientist. But I do know this. Uh, 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 $8 is more than nothing. And I said, hold on, let me check that out. You know you're right. $8 a month, more than that. He said, so you still know I can't do the $8. He says, well, why? I said, listen, I need the $8 to make sure that the ends look at each other. I can't do the normal hours of managing, uh, of, 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 of management hours, 56 hours a week, because I won't be able to do school the way I'm supposed to be able to do it. And he, saw, he starts asking me, he said, well, friends, let me ask you this question. He said, how are you going to pay your bills? I said, I don't know. He said, how are you going to pay your card note? I said, I don't know. He says, how are you going to pay for school? I said, I don't know. He said, how are you going to pay a light bill? I don't know. And then he asked me this question. And the answer to any of that, I didn't know any of that stuff. But then he asked me this question. How are you going to eat, friends? And that's when the Lord gave me the answer I needed. I was like, I don't know. But you know what? I didn't come here to eat. God did not send me to Dallas to eat. God did not send me to Dallas to pay bills. God did not send me to Dallas to work at Ecker. God sent me to Dallas to be trained to serve people and ministry and anything or anybody that gets in the way of that got to go. So I can't do 60 hours a week because God didn't send me here to do 60 hours a week. I could have done 60 hours a week in Houston. God didn't send me here to kill myself for you to make money for you. I could have done that in Houston. No, here's what God did. God sent me here to prepare me to serve people in ministry. And you know what God did? He set up a circumstance and situation where I would have to exercise faith in him. You know why? Because he knew 27 years later I would have to come to Houston, Texas at the Greater Friendship Church and tell somebody how to trust Jesus. And I can't tell nobody how to trust Jesus if I have never trusted Jesus. So I can stand here and tell you when you ain't got no job, he'll make a way. I can tell you when you ain't got no income in the, in the coming in the house, he will make a way. When you ain't got nobody helping you out, he will make a way. When everybody say you won't make it, God will make a way. And more than making a way, he will keep your mind sane. He will keep your heart mended. He will restore your crushed spirit. Why? Because the peace of God passes all understanding will guard your heart and your mind. But not only is God's peace peculiar, not only is it protective, but the peace of God is powerful. I'm trying to convince you of this, that the peace of God is your salvation. The fact that you are a believer from God, you don't have to go crazy. You, you, you don't have to lose your mind when the storm comes. Why? Because the Bible says the peace of God protects you. The fact that you're a believer keeps you from losing your mind and losing your heart. Uh, but the peace of God is a strange thing. 
unique in its source and it's unique in its object, sourced in God and, 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 and given to those who trust God. Yeah. <sighs> but it's strange. Why? Because it surpasses all understanding. This word surpasses means it transcends. It goes beyond. It, it, it extends beyond your ability, your and my ability, to put our arms around it. To put our head around it. To grasp it. It, 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 it'll mess your mind up, in other words. Uh, the peace of God will blow your mind because God will give you peace, not only in situations where you're not supposed to have peace, <laughs> but God will give you peace when you don't even want it. <laughs> David, David says David is on the run. <laughs> David is on the run from his son Absalom in Psalm chapter 4, Psalm number 4. And he's on the run from his son. His son is trying to kill him. His, uh, his friends are trying to kill him. And at the end of the day, David says in verse 7 and 8, I will both lie down in peace. Why? For thou alone, O Lord, does cause me to dwell in safety. He says my son is trying to kill me. My ex-cabinet members are trying to kill me. And I am on the run from my life. I'm about to die. But you know what? <laughs> I'm going to bed. Years ago, they used to say, take a BC power and go to bed. I am going to bed. Why? Because if God is going to take care of me, ain't nothing I can do about it anyway. Come on here, Absalom, and attack me if you want to. If God alone causes me to dwell in peace. God will give you peace when you don't even want it. God will give you peace when you ain't even expecting it. So back in 19, uh, January 9, 2003, and this man right here can tell you exactly because he talked me out of talking about somebody bad. I'm talking about, I was, was going to take all of my religion and put it on the side and just go stone cold Negro. And he talked me out of it and said, that's not what God wants you to do. But watch this. The Lord saw fit to take my mother home. Okay, God, you are sovereign. I don't care, but I do have a problem with that, God. Because I'm sitting over here and I'm praying over the empty shell of what used to be the woman that gave birth to me. And here this woman is, has done the best she could to win every generation she's ever engaged to win them to you. And now here I am, I'm driving over here on South Main and 610 and I'm seeing some ladies in the evening walk out during the daytime and I'm wondering why, why would you take her home and leave these freaks here? I've got some bad understanding here, God, why would you leave them here? They ain't telling nobody, they ain't doing no street evangelism. They ain't doing no street preaching. Why would you take bring Victoria home and leave these freaks right about here? I ain't the only one ever talked to God like that. Don't look at me like I'm crazy. I don't get this and I don't understand this, God. And for seven weeks, all I did was watch my mother deteriorate. And I'm wondering, why would God allow this to happen? And so God decides to bring her home. And I remember that Saturday, I get home. I am fully dressed. I am dressed in an overcoat and a hat. And I get home to my, to my house. And I said, God. I want to thank you for how you have kept me for the last seven weeks. You've been good. You've been kind. And you've been gracious. But Lord, I thank you. But, 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 but Lord, I, I, I don't want to have it all together right now. I, I want to crack up. I want to be like Florida Evans right now, God. Uh, I want to fall out in the middle of the floor like James Brown right now. So, Lord, if you would be so kind as to let me crack up, I would appreciate it. But, Lord, you got to let me crack up real quick because i got to preach tomorrow and I'm not through working on my sermon. So, let me crack up so I can go on about my business. And the more I sat there, I realized the Lord wasn't letting me crack up. And I became angry with God because I started verbalizing my displeasure. Wait a minute. You let Moses crack up, but you won't let Junior Brown crack up. You let David crack up, but you won't let Junior Brown crack up. You let Peter crack up, but you won't let Junior Brown crack up. You let Jesus crack up, but you won't let Junior Brown. I don't get you, God. I want to crack up right now, but you won't let me. And then I said, since the Lord won't let me crack up, I may as well just read the Bible. So I started reading in Philippians chapter 1, and I got all the way over here to Philippians chapter 4, and I noticed these words, and the peace of God, which surpasses 
understanding. Now, wait a minute, greater friendship. I'm supposed to be a smart fella here. I've been to school for this stuff. I have studied this stuff. I've translated the New Testament from Greek to English twice. I'm supposed to be smart. I know what these words mean, but somehow I missed the word all. <laughs> somehow I didn't know what all meant. All these other four and five syllable words, somehow I missed all. I thought all meant that you wouldn't understand why I was cracking up. I thought all meant that I wouldn't understand why you wasn't cracking up. I didn't know all meant that I wouldn't understand why I wasn't cracking up. And all says the peace of God surpasses everybody's understanding. Even if you call yourself a preacher, even if you call yourself a seminary trained preacher, the peace of God surpasses all understanding. So here I am trying to crack up and the Lord won't let me because the peace of God that keeps you from cracking up blows your mind. It is far exceeds your understanding of what God can do. The peace of God is powerful. God has determined no, cracking up ain't, ain't, ain't an option here because see my name on the line. <laughs> And some folk are watching you. If you crack up, they're going to start wondering and saying, uh-uh, his God can't keep him. <laughs> his God can't hold him when it gets bad. So guess what, Junior Brown? You just going to have to be disappointed with me because you ain't cracking up today. <laughs> you might crack up tomorrow, but I ain't letting you crack up today. Why? Because the peace of God blows your mind. You extend beyond your, your ability and your senses to grasp well, I hear what you're saying. Uh -huh. Reverend, I appreciate the fact yeah, yeah. All right, now. that the peace of God is peculiar. Yeah. Praise God, it comes from him, and it is only meant, and it's isolated, and only meant, and it's exclusive for believers. Oh. I thank you that the peace of God is protective, keeps me from cracking up. Yeah. I thank you that the peace of God is powerful, it extends beyond my ability to resist it and my ability to understand it. But, 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 but Reverend, you, you, you titled your sermon, The Promise of Peace. Yeah, yeah, right. Out of all that you've said so far, <laughs> you ain't gave no peace. Uh, hey, where, 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 you ain't gave no promise. Where is the promise? If you want to look at the promise, I want you to look at verse number seven again. And I want you to notice this word. We're going to read it together. And. Yeah. Stop right there. Yeah. This word and is what we call a conjunction. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, a conjunction is a word that connects phrases and thoughts and sentences. Uh, those of us here who were raised during the 70s, uh, the real people, we, 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 we know about conjunctions. And one of the great benefits that we had growing up, we had this, 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 this TV program that came on on Saturdays called Schoolhouse Rock. I, I love Schoolhouse Rock. Schoolhouse Rock was, was cool because you could be dumb six days a week. You could be dumb Sunday through Friday. Mess up your timetables, mess up civics, mess up English, mess up everything, but then get smart on Saturday with Schoolhouse Rock. Because Schoolhouse Rock was this educational program that simply said these words, if you messed up your timetables, I'm going to teach you about number nine on Saturday. <laughs> you young girls, go Google it. You'll love it. I'll put it on YouTube somewhere, I know. If, 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 if you don't know anything about civics, Schoolhouse Rock said, I'm just a bill. Yes, I'm only a bill. And I got as far as Capitol Hill. <laughs> if you didn't know anything about grammar, Schoolhouse Rock, Luther Vandross will tell you about verbs. <laughs> but here the most popular episode episode of Schoolhouse Rock was the episode called Conjunctions. <laughs> Let me see if I got some real people in here. It would go something like this, Conjunction Junction. There are real people right there. Hooking up phrases and clauses and sentences. And what we have here in verse number seven is what we call a result conjunction. In other words, it is introducing the result of what was said before. Mm, what was said before. Verse number six says, be anxious for nothing, but, but in everything by prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving, make your request known to God. He said, therefore, 
was used for prayer there. Don't be, don't be scared about nothing. Don't be worried about nothing. But in prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving, make your request known to God. And the result of that is mm, you pray to God. You talk to God. You be thankful to God. And the result of that is mm, you pray to God. You talk to God. You be thankful to God. And the result of that is the peace of God will keep you from cracking up. Here I am talking to God. I'm saying, oh, oh God, I messed up because for the last seven weeks, all I've been doing, I've been on my knees in the hospital and in my house saying, God, bring my mother back here. Say, touch her body and heal her body. God, I thank you for her. Thank you that she introduced me to you. Thank you that she modeled me, you modeled you to me. And then for seven weeks, all I had done was to thank God, praise God, make my request known to God. And God said, Julie Brown, if you want to crack up, you shouldn't have done verse number six. But since you did verse number six, I ain't going to let you crack up. There will be no Florida Evans here today. There will be no James Brown here today because you did verse six. You want to avoid cracking up here? Paul says you talk to God. And don't talk to him short. Talk to him long. Make your request known to God and thank him for what he's already done. And in the long run, the Lord will keep you from losing your mind. He will keep you from losing your heart. Here we are. Katrina and Harvey. Wreaking havoc all on the surface of the water wreaking havoc in the lives of family and friends and even some of those who are sitting in this room. <laughs> Killing people. $115 billion in damage. 2,100 deaths. Hundreds and thousands of homes destroyed. Devastation and destruction on the surface. But just 25 feet beneath the water. <laughs> All is calm, cool, and collected. The fish are having a wonderful time hanging out at the fish park going to the fish mall eating at the fish pompadours shopping at the fish walmart dealing with the fish starbucks unbothered unagitated and undeterred by the destruction that's on top and you know why they are able to do that because the effects of a storm only go 24 feet deep <laughs> y'all miss that y'all gonna catch that on 59 the storm only goes 24 four feet deep, but the fish are living 25 feet deep. In other words, when the storm comes into your life, you need to go deeper. Deeper with God. Deeper in prayer. Deeper in worship. Deeper in exalting God. Deeper in praising his name. Deeper in extolling him. And when you go deeper, it's not that you won't have storms, but the storms won't mess up your mind. The storms won't mess with your heart. Folk will be wondering how he get through that. How is she dealing with that? And you can dance and shout and tell him, I'm dealing with it because I'm going deeper with God. Or be somebody here and say, look, I know what it's like to go through. I can testify that God will bring you up. God will keep your mind regulated. God will mend your broken heart. God will restore your crushed spirit. God will keep you from losing your mind. But he ain't doing that for nothing. Only when you go deep with him, he can say, I want everybody to notice you. I'm using you as a testimony. Don't forget that your storm ain't for you. God trying to get a testimony out of you. And he can't do nothing with you until he does something to you. You want to be great with God. God has to break your spirit. Peace is peculiar. It is sourced in God and meant only for believers. It's protective. Keep you from losing your mind. It's powerful. <laughs> it surpasses your ability to understand it. And praise God, most of all, it is promised. He says, if you talk to me, you bring your Bible says, take your burdens to the Lord. Bring your cares to me. Boy, you can't handle them anyway. Last 15 years, you've been trying to fight that fight, and you ain't won yet. Bring your cares to me. 
And in the midst of you bringing your cares to me, I'm going to do something real special. <laughs> Instead of delivering you out of the storm, I'm going to deliver you in the storm. I'm going to deliver you in your mess so everybody knows that there is a God in heaven who sits high and looks low and they will fear the Lord. Why? Because I kept you from losing your mind. Peace of God is promised. Yes, it is. Amen.